Okay, so this poem will be the painter of Umbria. It's one of the poems that Dobson will be looking at. It's not quite as long as the Ship of Ice, but just because a painting or a poem is small, that doesn't mean there's not a lot in it. Uh, this poem was one of the ones that makes it more obvious to us that Dobson considers poetry and painting to be related arts, both creative expressions of an artist. So the painter of Umbria simply is about a man who is devoted to his his art, and as we go through, you want to consider how this may or may not mirror Dobson's own work, especially as we'll be considering poems from her early 20s right up until her late life. I'll try not to make this crazy long, so let's get into it. Okay, so Painter of Umbria. Let's do a read through first. And then after we've done that, we'll go through and analyze the meeting. <clears throat> so, Francesco Calvi, Umbrian by birth, a silent lad, scraped angels in the dust, then struck for pens and brushes, swagged them up, aged 12 or thereabouts, and quit his town. Wider than oxen with the dust he trod, when these he passed, and taller by a length than the last rooftops of San Severo diminished as he reached the further slope. And, looking back, appraised the distance done, he came to Florence, once apprenticed there, forgot the olive trees, the Umbrian hills, the small black tempests of the cypresses in the blue morning. Briefly made his mark, preferred his studies to the priory, jostling his fellow students for the laurel, and now with brush upon the chapter walls, he hymns his praises. Stroke on stroke of paint builds up his perfect virgin. There he sits, enthroned beneath a gothic canopy. Her hands held upwards, fingers touching thus. Two thin white lilies pressed against the wind. Devout her eyes, her soul attuned to hear, angelic voices heralding a birth. Attentive to angels, diligent with lilies, Francesco Calvi paints from dawn to darkness and lights a taper, ponders his creation. At night he dreams of angels, all day long their bright wings brush against him, till it seems the world is Florence, Florence is the chapel, and all the people in his world angelic. Now is the marbled floor almost completed, the shining walls and towers beyond the window, the flowers falling through the air from heaven, want not a brush stroke. One place is empty, Waiting among that lovely brood of creatures, fit space to put a man in, our Francesco, grown old and tired beside his magnum opus, measures his side against the unpainted plaster, straightens his back, puts down at last his brushes, and joins his angels grouped about the Virgin. The legend says they sang an ave of welcome, till all the monks turned over in their slumbers and climbed a further rung up Jacob's ladder. Okay, so there's a sense in which this poem is fairly straightforward, and we can interpret it in a fairly straightforward way. There's a story of this boy, Francesco, who's born in Umbria. He's a bit of a dreamer. He tends to draw angels in the dust. Uh, so he leaves his home because his home doesn't have much to offer him. He journeys to Florence, the capital of art, city of dreams, and he paints his magnum opus, his masterpiece, which is uh, his painting of the Virgin Mary amongst angels and other things in the chapel he's painting. And then finally, his life's work complete. Uh, he's able to rest in peace, perhaps climbing Jacob's ladder to heaven or being closer to heaven than he ever has been. So this, this basic story is lovely. We're going to have a look at each section in a bit more detail. And as we go, I want to see, see if you can find what other meaning there might be within this story. So the first thing we need to notice is that Francesco Calvi uh, is an everyman. He's a fictional character, not like Bruegel in a poem she's written before this in Ship of Ice, Painter of Antwerp, or The Mirror in the Mirror. So an everyman in literature is someone who the audience can identify with, someone who is supposed to represent a common experience or a common experience of someone. Someone who's supposed to be just like everyone else. Yeah, so a question might be for this poem, what is Dobson pointing out about the common experience? Or what is she suggesting by saying this wasn't a, a great master of painting? 
just a normal uh, everyday painter. Uh, Umbrian by birth, so Umbria is a place in central Italy. A silent lad scraped angels in the dust. So scraped angels in the dust. If you were to characterize someone's childhood by saying scraped angels in the dust, what do you think that that means? What do angels represent and what does the dust represent? Then struck for pens and brushes, swagged them up and left his town. Uh, that should be quit his town. I've left in that animation from before. Uh, so, strike for pens and brushes. To strike for something can be to aim at it. If you strike for somewhere, you're going there. To strike camp, though, is to break camp. That works nicely with this word swag here, which we don't mean in the sense of Snoop Dogg. We mean pack up to leave, pack up camp. Uh, but to be struck for something also can mean lacking something. To be struck for pens and brushes means he doesn't have them. So he doesn't have them, he's packing up to leave, and he's striking out towards his goal. So questions? What is it that he swags up here? Yeah. It's from an earlier line. And how does this help us understand why he quit his town? And maybe... Uh, why the word dust was chosen to represent his childhood there as well. Okay, so uh, let's just briefly notice color at the start. So notice how colors change. I'm not gonna refer to it again, but I want you to keep an eye on it. So at the beginning we have dust, we have white oxen, dust again, uh, quite earthy, quite natural tones. Okay, moving on. Height and measurement becomes a theme here. So, wider than the oxen with the dust he trod. He's traveling down paths uh, with oxen and carts. And when these he passed, and taller by a length than the last rooftops of San Severo, diminished. So, he's taller by a length than the last rooftops. If it's the last rooftops, then we're leaving them behind. Uh, diminished. San Severo is diminished behind him. He's taller by a length. What does it mean to measure yourself against something? There's a key question here and towards the end of the poem. And then what does it mean to be taller by a length, perhaps? As he reached the further slope and looking back appraised the distance done, he came to Florence. All right, it's worth noting. So as he reached the further slope, he is traveling through the mountains. It's worth noting here that Umbria and San Severo and Florence are all in Italy. So here's a map for you. It's worth noting where their relative locations are. I'm just going to leave that for you, but think about how that might change the message. Okay, he came to Florence. So Florence is the city of art, of dreams. The civilization in Florence is in marked contrast with the stress on the natural environment of his home and his travels. So he came to Florence and he forgot the olive trees, the Umbrian hills, the small black tempests of the cypresses in the blue morning. So here is uh, Florence and here are some uh, black olive trees in a blue morning that I found. You can see that Florence is the height of civilization. It's very different to a small town where a country lad would grow up. So, what is the purpose of these three lines? Forget, forgot the olive trees, the Umbrian hills, the small black tempest of the cypresses in the blue morning. I have a theory, but I'm going to let you come up with your own, and we'll keep going. Briefly made his mark. Uh, preferred his studies to the Priory, jostling his fellow students for the role. So preferred is a solemn offer. The Priory is a place where Catholic mon monks lived and worked. The, the laurel is the prize or recognition. Uh, let's briefly look at these words, jostling his fellows for the laurel. So jostling and fellow students. Uh, what kind of association do these words have? What kind of atmosphere is Dobson building here? Uh, and how is this characteristic of Dobson? I want to think about that as we go. Chapter walls, <clears throat> that's the walls of the building or the chapter, uh, sorry, the chapel that would have been filled with holy paintings. So the floor, the walls, the roof, everywhere would have been holy paintings. 
Uh, I recommend you Google the Sistine Chapel video. You'll see a, a video of Michelangelo's paintings all through the Sistine Chapel. It's quite beautiful and it's a fairly similar image to the one that Francesco is trying to build here. And then finally, we end <clears throat> with the shortened, shortened half line here. He hymns his praises. A hymn is a holy song or poem. It's not usually a painting. So he hymns his praises. As he paints, he hymns. So I like to think that hymn sounds like hums. So I think he's working away contentedly here. He's found his place. Uh, he's left behind his childhood. He's achieving his goal. He's really content humming his praises. Okay, before we get into this next section, we need to explain who Mary was. Uh, so Christians and Catholics particularly place emphasis on Mary, but all Christians believe that uh, Mary conceived Jesus. She was the mother of uh, Jesus, and she conceived him. It was a divine conception, so she conceived him while she was still a virgin, uh, had Jesus while she was still a virgin. So she's known as Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus. So uh, she's very important to Catholics particularly. Uh, okay, let's get into it. So stroke on stroke of paint builds up his perfect version. There she sits. Uh, interesting to note here that he, it says his perfect version, not a perfect or the perfect version. It's his, so perhaps uh, suggesting familiarity or even ownership, but you can choose which one Dobson is more likely to be suggesting there. There she sits. Now we should notice this because it's a typo in our book. So. In ours, we have there he sits, but uh, it's actually there she sits. It's a, mis a printing error. So please change that in your book. Uh, enthroned beneath a gothic canopy. Gothic doesn't mean dresses up and goes to emo concerts. That's the style of painting that we were talking about, the, the way of talking about now. Uh, her hands hold upwards, fingers touching thus, two thin white lilies pressed against the wind. We have quite a long section of description here. It takes just as much space as his birth and travels. Perhaps that shows how much time Francesco devotes to her, how he dotes on her, how he carefully measures his brush strokes, uh, painting his, his masterpiece. Uh, okay, I've got a, a picture here. This is not what it would have looked like because it focused more on Francesco's focuses more on Mary and Jesus isn't present. But I chose this one because it shows all the angels clustered around Mary. And he would have eventually found his place somewhere in here. Uh, perhaps over there somewhere. Okay. Uh, moving on. So, attentive to angels, diligent with lilies. Francesco Calvi paints from dawn to darkness, then lights a taper, ponders his creation. At night he dreams of angels, all day long their bright wings brush against him, till it seems the world is Florence, Florence is the chapel, and all the people in his world angelic. Okay, this section here I'm going to skip through quickly, uh, but I want you to find every phrase that contributes to the idea that the whole world for Francesco has become his dream, or the whole world. Florence has become his whole world. Finally, uh, what do the split lines emphasize? There are a few throughout this poem. So here he hymns his praises, and then we have a clean break down to stroke on stroke of paint. Down here we have want not a brush, a brush stroke. These could have just been continued lines. Dobson is quite happy to use full stops in the middle of lines in other places. So I want you to think every time there's a split line, what does it emphasize? Okay, the final section. One place is empty. Uh, okay, before we get into it, a magnum opus, that's a masterpiece, your best work. Sometimes your life's work. So someone's magnum opus. Uh, measures his height is down here, grown, so Francesco is grown old and tired beside his magnum opus, beside implies working on. Measures his height against the um, painted plaster, again, 
what does it mean to measure your height against something? And what does it mean that he measures his height against his magnum opus? It's actually quite a lovely image. He straightens his back, puts down at last his brushes, and joins his angels grouped about the Virgin. So straightens his back, puts down his brushes. His work is done. He's old. Painters are uh, renowned for having terrible backs, so he's uh, straightening his back. He's more comfortable. His death is as normal, perhaps, as his life, and perhaps as beautiful. And he joins his angels grouped about the Virgin. Now, of course, this could mean literally, maybe he's found himself a, sp a spot on the plaster and just lied down on his painting, but that's not really the sense in which we're supposed to take it, is it? So he joins his angels. Uh, what theme of Dobson's is that relating to and what kind of uh, impression are we left with about it, about death? Okay. Uh, the legend says they sung an Ave of welcome, a hail, a welcome with honour. Uh, Ave is very much associated with Mary, common prayer being the Hail Mary, which in Latin is Ave Maria. You might have heard the song, it's quite famous. So all the monks turned over in their slumbers and climbed a further rung up Jacob's ladder. So think about what is the tone of the final three lines. How does this relate to this theme of death and how do we think about how is Dobson presenting death uh, in this in this context, in the context of Francesco's life. Okay, briefly, Jacob's ladder is another biblical reference. It's it's a ladder that led to heaven. Uh, there's a story uh, that you can find yourself, probably just with a Wikipedia, if no other way. And uh, this guy Jacob has a dream in which he climbs a ladder to heaven. So finally, to finish up this analysis, what does this poem mean? I want you to Try and write out a sentence of your own, summing that up. What might it celebrate? How would Dobson feel about Francesco as a poet, as an artist, and does it relate to her? Uh, why does she choose to make Francesco an everyman? She's quite happy to choose to get other poets, uh, to use other poets for her other poems, talk about them directly. So why does she make him an, an everyman, a common man? And finally, what symbols or concerns, techniques are used that are also used in Dobson's other poems. <clears throat> okay, for bonus marks, uh, Dobson had uh, an earlier poem, Painter of Antwerp, that she, paint, that she wrote in the Ship of Ice collection. It's quite different. It's about a real painter called Bruegel the Elder. It's particularly based on this one painting here. And in the poem, he rejects divine paintings and themes in favour of painting everyday scenes. It's written before the painter of Umbria, but also before some other events in her life. So I want you to think about, even if you don't read Painter of Antwerp, think about what might have changed in Dobson's attitude that she would now write a, a poem like the painter of Umbria.